My name is Adam Johnson. Uh, I work for Mattistown Speaker Components. Uh, and I recognize a lot of you in here uh, from the show or just uh, over the years or probably helped you on the phone with some builds. And otherwise, uh, to everyone who hasn't met me before, it's nice to meet you. And thanks for checking out this uh, presentation. Uh, so I've worked for Mattisown for six years now. And before that, um, I've had a lifetime of just music loving, concert listening, uh, or concert going, and just music listening and hi-fi systems. So it's been something I've done my entire life. And uh, now what I do on a day-to-day -day basis is advise and consult uh, speaker builders, and that's anyone from beginners uh, through commercial speaker manufacturers that are looking to get into new drivers uh, for their systems. Uh, so what we're going to do today is just I'm going to give a basic overview of DIY, DIY speaker building. Uh, I do apologize if some of it's a little basic, but I kind of want to make it make sure everyone can kind of get it and get an idea of it. Um, and then once we're done with that part, I'm actually going to assemble one of our speaker kits for you and uh, show you what goes from beginning to end as far as assembling a speaker. So first thing, why build your own speakers? Um, one of the main reasons is going to be budget. What, you, what you'll find is you can build yourself a really high-end set of speakers for a fraction of the cost that you would find those same components in a commercially finished system. So it's not to say that you can't build, buy a nice system for that same price, but generally speaking, you'll end up with much higher parts throughout your system than you would if you bought a finished system. So that's one of the main parts of, of DIY speaker building, why people get into it. You can use high-end parts. I mean, you'll see the parts when you go around into these rooms, you'll recognize a lot of those drivers. Well, those drivers, you can also build speakers with yourself. And if they're a little bit out of your range, you can also get, it, you know, you can get into that. So the next would be pride, uh, pride of ownership. So it's always fun to build something for yourself. And a set of speakers, you can get decades of enjoyment out of. Now, that would be if you actually only kept one set of speakers. But some people do, and they'll last forever. And you know, we have people call us looking to replace drivers from speakers they built 30 years ago. And they, can, they still have those up and running in their listening rooms. Uh, so there's very few things that you can uh, say that about, you know, as far as a consumer good, but speakers in general is one of them, and building your own applies to that as well. So the next would be community, and that's pretty simple. I mean, we're all here for the reason that we love music, and we love music reproduction. So this applies to DIY speaker building as well. We can share our projects with our friends, the success with our family. You know, everyone can kind of take part uh, in your hobby, and... Uh, Aside from that, there's a whole world of discussion forums online as far as DIY speaker building goes. And that's where you can ask questions, share your ideas, show off your projects, um, you know, be, something, be part of something that's a little more than just you in your living room or in your listening room listening to your speakers. So now we've got to figure out what makes a speaker. Well, pretty simple here. You've got your drivers, crossovers, enclosure, and then parts, which you'll, we'll get into here. So the first thing we're going to talk about is drivers. So first type of drivers, high efficiency full range. So these drivers are designed to reproduce the entire frequency range without a crossover to just use a single driver and cover the entire range within the limitations of its size. Uh, this is a four and a half inch driver. You know, it can cover a pretty reasonable range, but they, you can get full rangers up to 10 inches, maybe even 12. Uh, so that's one type there. Uh, more traditional, we'd be looking at woofers. So the woofer, you can think of as the base driver. And this would be considered a woofer. This is a 7-inch driver. Of course, the sky's the limit. You know, they go up to 30-plus inches. But you'll find 7, 8, 10, 12. You know, most of those you'll see in the, in the systems here. Um, after that, we'd be looking at mid-range units. Uh, as you can imagine, they cover the middle part of the frequency range. Uh, this is a 3-inch mid-range. A mid-range can just is dependent on the system it's being used in. Uh, but they cover the middle. And then up top, of course, uh, you've got your tweeters. And uh, these are just a couple examples of, of tweeters you might see you know, out and about. Uh, but it's you know, going to be a soft dome or a ribbon, typically. So as far as configurations go, you've got the full range that we talked about. You've got a more popular would probably be a two-way. You know, you've got a tweeter up top, woofer below. After that, you do a three-way. You know, you've seen these all before, I'm sure. But, you know, tweeter up top, mid-range, 
woofer below. Uh, after that, MTM would have, it's called mid, mid, tweeter, mid. So you have mid woofer, tweeter, mid below that. And then you'll see a lot of systems here, uh, especially, and it's not, doesn't apply to do it yourself as much unless you're an advanced builder, but you know, see the high end systems here are much more than just three ways. You know, a lot of them will have, you know, five, 10, 12 drivers in them, just depending. Uh, so that's the types there. Um, to go along with the drivers, you gotta worry about the crossover. And that's a very key component in speaker building, uh, and speakers in general. And there's two types of crossovers. You have active crossovers, very viable option for speaker building, great flexibility, but often comes with added cost, complexity, equipment. So most speakers here and in DIY speaker building, uh, they're actually gonna use, oops, sorry. They're, they're actually gonna use uh, passive crossover networks. And passive crossover networks comprise of three main parts. And the first is gonna be an inductor or a coil. Um, basically it's wound copper, tightly wound copper. Uh, these are a couple of just different types of coils. They go up in size from here. Uh, but the inductors, you can think of them as chokes. Uh, the more wire, the larger the coil, the more inductance, the more the frequency band that is blocked from going through. So it's a low-pass filter. The signal that runs through an inductor goes through. On the other end, you're basically blocking out the high frequencies. So after that, you know, an inductor is basically, if you're running a, a system, your signal is coming through here, through the inductor, and to the woofer. In a, basic, in a basic term, your woofer will have a, the inductor would be the main part that's in line with it. After that, you have caps or capacitors, uh, kind of the inverse of, or the opposite of inductors. They block low frequencies from going through. So the capacitor is typically, it's going to be tightly wound polypropylene, and it's designed to block the low frequencies, like I said. Uh, the more material you use, the higher the capacitance, the more the low frequencies that'll, that'll be filtered out. And in a tweeter, you know, this is a pretty typical looking capacitor here. Uh, signal coming through, through the capacitor, and to the tweeter. So that's just a, kind of an overview of, of where the capacitor would fall in line uh, in a real simple network. And then after the, the capacitors, you have resistors, which are just that. Uh, they offer resistance, and it's measured in ohms. And the, the primary function of a resistor, uh, there's a couple different types. You have sand cast, wire wound, and metal oxide. But they're used in a crossover network to, to, you can think of it as a level match. And they're designed to basically bring down the level of a tweeter or a mid-range to match that of the, of the driver below it. So a tweeter is going to have a lot more output you know, with a given signal than a woofer. So in order to bring that down, you put resistance in line. So we've got the inductors, caps, resistors. That's the basic function of them. In more advanced next networks, which are most networks, they'll be used in combination for impedance compensation networks, notch filters to tame cone breakup, um, shaping of unruly response in drivers. So there's a lot more that goes in you know, than just the cap coil resistor in a simple network. It's usually a large combination of parts, as you can probably see on the picture here, actually, uh, which is a pretty typical build. Uh, so I'm going to give you a brief overview of a crossover in place now that we kind of looked at what the parts that go into it are. And uh, this next slide, it's a frequency response, a measured response of individual drivers. So in this case, we're looking at a three-way with a tweeter, a mid-range, and a woofer. There's no crossover in place here. And these are just overlap responses. So this is the woofers, uh, if you look up on the slide there, the woofer is on the left. It goes down the lowest in the frequency range. If you look at the bottom, that's 20 hertz or so, you know, it would be the low end, 20,000 the top. So the woofer starts off and then kind of falls apart as it goes up. Uh, the mid-range, as we would expect, covers kind of a middle section. And then the tweeter up top, if you follow that line down, you can see it actually doesn't have much response above you know, 1,000 hertz or so. So you take the raw driver's measurements. Once you put a crossover in place, this is what you can expect when you measure those drivers after that. So the woofer now is rolling off, and it's kind of you know, falling off at around 350 hertz there. Mid-range, it's going to be crossed over on both the top and the bottom end. 
350, you know, where it intersects with the woofer, and then on the top, about 3,500 hertz, uh, where it meets the tweeter. And then the tweeter, as you can see, it's starting to roll off, you know, much sooner. You know, so it's just carrying a, a higher frequency range. And the reason we do this is you want each driver to cover the range that it's most comfortable in. So even though it can produce, like in the first slide, a, a much broader range, its usable range where it sounds the best is going to be something like this. So then when you take a measurement of all these together, the result's going to be ideally a flat response. So this is all the drivers running together with the crossovers in place. So if we look back, you can see where the woofer and mid-range intersect. They're, you know, they're both down a few decibel points, uh, or a few, a few decibels at that point. And uh, when they're combined together, they move up into a flat response. Uh, so that should give you a kind of a, hopefully a basic understanding of like how a crossover works when it's in place uh, with the drivers. And uh, designing crossovers is not an easy task. Uh, you can give your hand online with some calculators and you plug in some parameters. Uh, and you can actually tinker around and you know, experiment with what these parts do. But you know, it's, that's just the beginning. It gets pretty complicated uh, from there. But uh, the next part we're talking about is going to be enclosures. The most common enclosure is going to be a base reflex enclosure or ported enclosure. And these are the most widely used. And the reason is you can, you can count on a pretty compact size re relative to the size of the driver, and you can get the best base response out of it, generally speaking. Uh, so a ported enclosure is going to have uh, a combination. What you do is it's a, it's a calculation, basically, of the driver's parameters, which are called teal small parameters. And those combined with the enclosure size, you get your desired tuning frequency. And to achieve that, you usually use you know, a given diameter port. In this case, would be two inches in diameter, and then by a certain length. And that would give you the desired tuning frequency. And there's programs that help with that. Uh, but that's how you get good base response out of a driver, even of a relatively small size. Uh, the next, also pretty common, is a, called acoustic suspension or sealed. And it's just what it sounds like. I mean, you put a driver in an enclosure, and you just let it, you know, you're not altering its base response at all. So when you do this, you have to be very selective with the driver that you're using because not all of them behave well in a sealed box. They'll all work, but a lot of them will have no base response. So you're looking for certain parameters of a driver if you want to use it and have good base response uh, in a sealed box. So next is a pretty fun type of enclosure. Uh, you won't find them too much in... Uh, traditional two ways or three ways, but as far as the full range that we were talking about, uh, show an example here. Now, this is a backloaded horn. Oops. OK. So pretty complex. Uh, the enclosure itself can, can be thought of as a, the throat and the opening into the rest of the chamber acts as a low-pass filter. So you're not going to get any mid-range or high-frequency leakage through that horn. Um, and it's essentially boosting the base response of a driver, for example, like this size. You know, this driver on its own in a sealed or a ported box, like we were talking about, it won't do anything. But you put it in a, in a folded horn enclosure, and all of a sudden you're going to get something that resembles real base response. And something like this, a, a folded horn's good, simple as far as a full range, no crossover, difficult as far as building the cabinet. So it's kind of a trade-off there. And uh, other types, a little less popular, but definitely you'll, you'll find around. Transmission line, uh, it's a type of a tuned enclosure. It's kind of similar to a folded horn. Uh, they tend to be rather large, and, but they give great base response. And then the next would be open baffle. Simple to build, very difficult to execute. Uh, that's where you'll have basically the driver uh, operating almost in free air, or essentially in free air. There's just no back on the enclosure. And typically when you do that, you need some sort of an active network uh, to, to compensate for there. So, uh, so we've gone drivers, crossover, enclosure, basic parts of a speaker. The next would be the parts, just miscellaneous speaker building parts. And this is stuff that you're going to find in any speaker. It doesn't matter whether you're building it yourself or it's in a commercial design, and you open it up and see what's in there. Uh, so hookup wire, I mean, we're just talking speaker wire here, you know, runs of speaker wire. You connect it, 
you know, connect the drivers, the crossover, the input cup. Uh, input cup, binding posts, put it on the back of the cabinet. It's where your speaker wire goes from, you know, your amplifier runs into this from here to the crossover, crossover to the, to the drivers. Uh, port tube, like we talked about. Uh, let's see here. Foam tapes, you know, make, make some seals. Uh, dampening materials, line the walls of your enclosure, uh, like acoustic foam, uh, fiber fill. All these things are used, you know, in, in speaker building. Uh, it, like I said, in almost any speaker, besides probably an open baffle. Uh, so got all that taken care of. Uh, got some decisions to make if you're going to build yourself a speaker. Uh, the first... If you're a beginner, you typically want to choose like a kit, something that Madison would have, or Parts Express, or you know, there's other companies that do speaker kits. Uh, and you can, the design's already, the design work's done. The drivers are are picked out for you. The enclosure's already, uh, you know, figured out the tuning, all that. Once you advance beyond that, then you start getting into, you know, hardware and software to where you're taking your own measurements uh, and designing your own crossovers. Uh, so that's. The first decision, I mean, it's a pretty simple decision when you're starting. Uh, you build something that already, the design already exists, and you acquire all the parts and put it together. Um, the next is if you're going to build your own cabinets or not. So a lot of woodworkers out there, or if you have the access to, you know, tools and, and you have the skills, I mean, building your own cabinets, it's a great way to go because you can dictate how they're going to look and how large they are, and you can, you know, basically build any design that's out there. And uh, that's, that's, pretty, uh, that's pretty nice. Otherwise, though, you'll see systems like this where there's pre-existing cabinets. Uh, and you can either cut the baffles yourself, or a lot of times they'll have pre-built or pre-cut baffles. Uh, so this would be a, you know, a speaker, that, speaker box that's available. You, know, you can purchase it. It's already finished. Real wood veneer, you know, all of that. Something like this you can buy in a flat pack, put it together yourself with glue and... Uh, Wood glue and clamps, pretty easy. Uh, pre-cut baffles, you know, you don't even have to use a router. So no woodworking if you go that route. Then as far as crossovers go, so we had all these parts we were looking at. And you can put these together yourself, or you can have someone do it for you. Uh, if you do it yourself, you can basically figure out the layout. Um, you can do point-to-point wiring. Uh, you can basically, you know, it's a more advanced step in the speaker building process. Otherwise, you can have it done. So this would be a assembled crossover. So you've got all your caps, coils, resistors on a printed circuit board. You'll get a hookup sheet. You know, it tells you where to, where the inputs are from the source, where the output is to the tweeter, output to the woofer. It makes it a little more simple, but uh, you know, it's taking a step away from doing the whole thing yourself. As far as the uh, crossovers go, I wanted to show you this uh, schematic here. So when you look at this, this is going to be the schematic for the speaker that uh, I'm going to put together in a little bit here. And uh, along the top line with the, the uh, vertical lines are the caps, which are measure, measured in microfarads, uh, the, the coils, the little squigglies, uh, that represents the coils, and then the rectangles are the resistors. So. That would be the schematic for this crossover here. So all these parts values are going to match what is up on the, uh, on the slide here. So now, OK, so this is going to be the most fun part of it. The lecture is over. Uh, I'm going to put together one of our speaker kits. Uh, it's the schematic I showed you. Uh, it's, the brand is Seos out of Norway. They make very high-end drivers. Um, drivers we're going to use is a, this is a wave, type of waveguide uh, tweeter. With a, it's a, it has a mesh cover on it, but it's actually an aluminum dome tweeter, uh, one inch, which most tweeters are going to be. And then the mid-base driver, this is going to be a, t- a two-way, uh, is the Seos uh, seven-inch. Uh, it's, it's called a curve cone. It's a woven polypropylene cone. Uh, so these are going to be the two drivers. This is the crossover. The, uh, the first step we're going to do, so w- let's just assume you bought this kit and what you would go through to put it together and how easy it could be. Uh, I have consolidated some steps so we're not here all day because a typical build like this will take a couple hours, uh, but we should be able to do it relatively quickly. 
you've got the crossover like I showed you. You have all the inputs and outputs. You need to connect speaker wire to it. So you would end up with you know, some bulk speaker wire, and you're going to want to cut it uh, to proper lengths you know, for, for the kit. So you know, a small piece to go from the input cup to the crossover, a little bit longer piece to go to the, the mid-bass driver, a little bit longer to go to the tweeter. Uh, so you'd cut it, strip the ends. Uh, you can use something like this or a wire stripper. Uh, and then you'd end up putting quick connects on it, which are just these little uh, female tabs that you would crimp on, and then you would attach to the, uh, to the circuit board. Now, that's the easiest way to do it. If you're handy with a soldering iron, that's going to be the recommended way to attach all your wires because uh, it's a little more permanent. Uh, it's not 100% essential, but uh, what I've gone ahead and done is kind of eliminated the process of, all, of doing that here in front of you. But, so what we've got here is the assembled crossover. We've got all the wires attached. So uh, this is the input. So this is going to go for, you know, the signal is traveling from the amplifier to the speaker, from the speaker box into the crossover. Uh, this is the output for the woofer. Uh, so this will be covering the mid, you know, middle and low frequencies. And uh, this is going to go to the tweeter. Usually when you do a build, it's a good idea to mark something so you know exactly what these are, especially once you get everything going. Uh, so what we'll do here is going to first step is going to be install the crossover in the cabinet. Now this cabinet comes with a solid baffle. If you were doing a different combination, you'd want to think about cutting your own baffle. Uh, so you'd use a router and a circle jig. Something you can teach yourself to do, you know, probably in an afternoon. You do a couple runs on some scrap wood before, you know, hacking up your baffle. But in this case, we have pre-cut baffles available. And what they're going to, they're going to be precisely CNC cut for a flush mount of the tweeter, the woofer, uh, and the port tube. So this will just take a second here, and I'm going to actually install the crossover onto the, into the cabinet here. And one little tip here. This is three-quarter inch wood. Make sure you use screws that are less than the, the length. <laughs> Not that that's ever happened. <laughs> so that it's a quick way to ruin your finish. So. Are you using standoffs? I'm not. I have some foam tape on the bottom, uh, so that would reduce the vib any possible vibration between the back of the cabinet uh, and the uh, and the enclosure. Standoffs would are perfectly acceptable. Um, rubber ones, for, perhaps, you know, something like that. Um, okay. So the crossover has four pre-drilled holes on it. I probably recommend using them all because uh, I mean, there's a chance you'd want to get back in here if something went wrong. But I don't know. The, the better it's mounted in there, and the less possible vibrations, the better. Okay, pretty easy. We've got the crossover installed. So in this situation, the crossover board is relatively large. Uh, we would, you know, if it were a different kit or, you know, a different design, sorry. mounting on the back wall is an option. You know, it's not the only option. We could do it on the side wall. We could do it on the bottom. Uh, but in this case, it just makes the most sense. It's easiest to, uh, to apply right there. So this, this foam will usually come in a pretty large foam sheet. What you're going to do is you're going to take some measurements and cut it. Uh, to the size of your internal walls. And it's going back. This just open cell foam. Uh, doesn't reduce the volume of the enclosure. Uh, you can use glue or staple, you know, staple gun to put this in. You can even press fit it in there uh, if you cut it right. Does, does it really matter what kind of foam 
do you use? Only because I'm an IT guy and I have a ton of foam from like Cisco router shipments and stuff, and it's actually really nice stuff. Please be helpful, so. Yep. Yeah, so is, what, the way you can test it is just blow on it. And if your breath grows through the other side, it's fine. Uh, but yeah, there's many different materials you can use to line the, uh, the walls of the cabinet. So like I said, I mean, this usually would take a little longer um, because you'd be cutting it and gluing it. But the idea is to just line as many possible of the open walls. When you normally do the terminal cup before you put the foam on the bottom? No, I'm not going to cover the terminal cup in this situation. Yeah. So this is what the cabinet would look like with the foam installed. Can we get a look? Okay. Next, what we're going to do is tease up some acoustic stuff. Hey, Adam. Yes. Question back. Yes. Now, well, you may be answering my question there, but um, so it's a two-piece thing because, because doesn't the, uh, you have to have a certain amount of acoustic Certain, certain ranges of frequency. Yeah, I mean, yeah, most designs are going to, whoever, for example, this, uh, this kit was actually designed by a gentleman uh, from SEOS sitting on the second to last row here, and uh, <laughs> Hovard. So he went, when he designed this system, he had this enclosure, and he experimented with different amounts of fill. So in a speaker kit like this, there's a certain amount that's called for and it's pre-measured and everything like that. And if you're doing your own, though, and starting from scratch, there's certain rules to follow as far as, you know, use some and then see how it sounds and stuff like that. But in this case, we're just going by the book, you know, what the, what the kit calls for. Yeah. So something like this, although I, to be honest with you, this is not the exact measured amount for this, this kit. Uh, <laughs> but we're going to, it'll be close enough. Uh, so this would be something. Now, because the crossover is going to be lined up with the woofer here. I'm a little concerned. You know, I'd prefer to have that back wall covered with foam and, you know, more damping materials. Uh, so I'm going to overcompensate a little with the polyfill in that situation and, and cover up the crossover, stuff it down there probably a little more than I normally would. Uh, but this is something you just tease up. This is a, a brand of fiber. It's Acousta stuff, complex fiber fill. If you want to mess around with it, if you can stretch it out. This, this can get probably about this big. Yes. What different purposes do, does the foam serve from the acoustic? They're, they're essentially doing the same thing. Yeah. But it looks a little nicer when you line the walls as opposed to just fill it up with uh, fill. OK. So this is generally what the inside of the speaker is going to look like. Now, the reason I haven't put any on the bottom is because the port, we're not going to, we don't want to interfere with the port tube whatsoever in the airflow within the cabinet. This is essentially to back, uh, break up the back wave of the woofer, dampen the enclosure. Uh, so that's what it, everyone get a good look at that. That's good? OK. So now, next step, we're going to install the input cup. So I'm going to put the wire out the back, flip it over. I've got these marked. Of course, observe polarity. Uh, let's see here. This is a uh, dual input cup binding post. This speaker is not bi-wired, but you could bi-wire the speaker. You could ask for it ahead of time. It's because this cabinet comes pre-cut for this, just giving more flexibility. This particular design, you know, bi-wire, bi-amp it. If you wanted to do it, you could. Uh, you could just request that. So this is pretty simple with the quick connects on here. And what I like to do... If I'm not soldering and I am using quick connects, it's just kind of give it a little, a little squeeze there. You don't want it coming off and having to open the cabinet back up or anything. And just run the little connectors over it. Okay. And this is actually just going to install with a few screws here. Pretty straightforward up to this point. And the input cup does have some, uh, 
just have some closed cell foam on the back. So as opposed to an open cell foam, you want something like a weather stripping uh, where no air leakage can occur. That's already built into the back of that, but we'll get to, we'll get to using those once we flip this back over. What about more tight? I'm sorry? More tight? Could you use that? No. What is it? It's basically a weather stripping like putty. Yeah. It will never, it will never, you know, break down. Well, and it doesn't, it's not permanent. It's removable too, correct? Yeah, it's nice to use stuff that doesn't set. Sure, sure. All right, so one more screw here in the back of the cabinet will be done. Okay, so pretty nice clean finish on the back. The speaker wire is now connected from the input cup to the crossover, so we have that part done. Next step is going, going to install the front baffle. Now this, for the, the case of this demonstration, we're going to use the foam tape. Many other materials you can use. I like the weather stripping caulk. Load it in your caulk gun, it doesn't set. Um, but here we have, you know, we need to make a good seal here for the baffle. I've already cut these to the right length and everything. Uh, but otherwise you get a big piece of this, measure it out, cut it. And it has an adhesive on one side. So the reason we're doing this is to have an air leak in a, uh, in a cabinet is actually, we, when we went back to the tuning of the cabinet, uh, it can really throw it off. So it's actually, a little, it's actually more important in a ported enclosure to have no air leaks because you're relying on the tuning of the, of the port tube. Uh, sealed box, it's not detrimental to the performance if you do have an air leak. Uh, although it's, you know, a good enclosure shouldn't have any leaks. Okay. Okay. Just attach the weather stripping all around the perimeter. Now we're gonna put on the front baffle. So at this point, I wanna pay attention to where these holes are lining up. This is gonna be the tweeter cutout, woofer cutout, port cutout. This is the bottom of the cabinet, this is the top. So obviously we want to have the baffle put on correctly. We'll bring the wires through. Sorry, I missed a step. Okay. The port tube, as we were talking about, uh, you, the typical port tube would come uncut at a certain length, and then depending on your design, it'll call for a particular length. Uh, this is supposed to be two inch diameter by looks to be about six or six, about six inches long. So the in this this original tube is cut to this length, and then we're going to get the correct uh, port length. So in that case. I'm going to press, in this situation, it's a press fit of the port tube into the front baffle. Definitely a good idea to glue this in, uh, but we can pass that up for now. And All right. So that's going to be the side view of the baffle, front view of the port. And just make sure this goes in a little better. Okay, so back to the wires here. Tweeter wire through here, mid base through here. Actually, at this point, I'm going to add a little Acousta stuff to the back of the cabinet. Just a nice touch so when you're looking at the cabinet later and it's completed, you're not seeing the wires through. Uh, another thing you do is actually you spray paint this black or something, or you know, to where when you're looking into the cabinet, you don't see the insides of it. But in this case, I'm just going to cover up the back inside here just so when it's finished, uh, you, you don't see any shiny uh, input cup or wires or anything like that. So this baffle goes on. Let's see here. And there's four screws that hold this into place. 
going to drop these into place here. It's a good idea when you do this. Start off, the, the weather stripping is going to compress initially, uh, but then maybe in a day or two go and retighten them, and you can just do that for the first few months that you have your speakers. I'm just going to tighten these up by hand to finish off just to make sure it's in there nice and tight. And of course, be careful not to strip them by over tightening. OK. So the baffle's on, sealed tight. Getting close here. So we're hitting the home stretch as far as the process goes. Next thing we're going to do use some more of this tape uh, to create an airtight seal between the baffle and the drivers. And this is just going to run around the perimeter of the cabinet, or of the recess hole in the cabinet, I should say. So some these particular drivers don't have gaskets built into them. Depending on the brand, uh, a lot of manufacturers will put those on there. Uh, in which case, this step would not be 100% necessary. OK. So just created a nice you know, circular gasket here out of that uh, foam gasket tape. What's the price of this kit? Yeah, this particular kit with cabinets is 698 Excuse me real quick. Per pair. pair, yeah, sorry. OK. Now, getting very close to the finish line, we're going to go ahead and install the speaker wire onto the tweeter first. And most tweeters are going to be marked, or most drivers, actually, in general, should be marked uh, with a positive near the positive terminal, and uh, neg sometimes a negative, but you can deduct that the one that's not positive is negative. So these go on relatively easily. And then it's always good to just kind of give them a final little squeeze here to make sure they don't come off. OK, so this is tweeter wires installed. Feed it down into the cabinet here. And next is going to be the woofer. On uh, this one, you can't really see it, but the tab is marked red uh, for positive on here. And just give them another squeeze here. OK, woofers installed. Now, I kept a little of the acoustic stuff out. And the reason is we don't want these wires flapping around inside the cabinet and bumping into each other. So what I do is basically I'm going to put a little in there on top of the speaker wire that's exposed. And it's going to be hard to show you, but that you can take my word for it. OK. So now we're in business. OK. We're ready to go. Wires are hooked up. You know Everything's together. All we have to do is screw in the drivers. In this case, I'm going to use hex heads wood screws. 
typically at this point, what you want to do is drill some pilot holes. First thing you want to do, once you put the drivers in, is make sure that the screws are lined up to how you want it to look. So if it has four screws and it's a little off-center, then you're going to be staring at a speaker that doesn't look quite symmetrical for the rest of your life. Uh, so, <laughs> not that anyone cares about that. Uh, let's see here. So I like these, uh, these hex head wood screws. And the reason is, as opposed to a Phillips head, when you're driving them into... Uh, driving them in to, to mount the driver, it can't slip off and puncture. You know, it, it's, it's, it's locking in, whereas you couldn't do that with a Phillips head. So it's just one of those little things that kind of makes a difference because then you're not going to be scratching up your baffle when you mess up or you're punching a hole through your cone or your surround. Uh, so it should be pretty simple here. I've already... I'm oh, sorry, I shouldn't talk during drilling that. Uh, I've already <laughs> taken the liberty of drilling pilot holes, uh, but that's what I would have done first. And I'm paying pretty close attention here to how far I'm putting the screws down in, because what I want this to end up with is a perfectly flush look. Uh, so right now with the foam tape in place, you, can't, I mean, you probably can't see it in the back, but the driver's actually sitting up above flush on the baffle, but there's the gasket tapes in there. So we have the ability to bring it down to exact flush. So good idea for performance on the tweeter and also for looks of the system. Huh? All right. All right, only six more screws to go, and then we'll have this thing up and running. Okay, it's done. So that's, that's it. <laughs> now the true test is, does it work? So we'll go ahead and give it a try. Now I don't think this speaker can really fill this whole room, but this would be a good speaker for a you know, regular sized listening room. And obviously you'd have two of them. So let's uh, get this going here. That's it. <laughs> All right. All right, so that's the end of my presentation. Let them roll. I have a question. Um, as far as the kits, do you do any kits that may resemble like other brands already out there, or is there any places? <laughs> I'm saying like go to Walgreens and it says instead of using this, use this. You know, so do you have something that like oh, you build this speaker it's kind of like the BMW Blue? You know? Not publicly, but if you call us and say, yeah, I, it's kind of like a close equivalent. Obviously, you can't do manufacture like they do, but maybe you have drivers that are similar or cabinet size that's similar to create because every speaker has its own signature sound. So do you have certain speakers that say may sound like, you know, a Dyn Audio, this will sound more like a Click, sure. or this will sound more like a Click? Sure. Those designs do exist, uh, but those are done by other do-it-yourselfers. Do uh, for us to do something like that would be in direct competition with our own customers. So because we don't just supply drivers to do-it-yourselfers, we supply them to original equipment manufacturers. So it's something that you can... 
if you do let your fingers do the walking, you can definitely find some clones out there. Uh, the Proact clones is like one of the most popular of all time as far as that goes. So, yeah. What about front versus rear bar? Good question. Um, really, it's not going to make any difference in the tuning. Um, as far as room placement goes, it's kind of a general consensus that if you're going to be using these close to a rear uh, boundary, it's better to front port. Uh, there is some talk about mid-range leakage through the front port, but that's not necessarily established. Uh, so front port's going to give you more flexibility. Uh, rear port, you know, you could get away with a different look as far as the, the enclosure goes. Anyone else? Yes? Does your company offer design services? We do, yeah. So if you had... Uh, picked out some drivers that you like and would like to see them used in a system and could not find an existing design for them, you know, through the online forums or, you know, a lot of manufacturers will publish kits themselves. But yeah, if you had your own combination, we can do a design uh, as far as the crossover goes and even assemble them for you. Now, it's not going to be a fully tested design. It's more of a simulation. So it's not the end-all, be-all as far as the speaker design goes. But it's, it's very useful and it's inexpensive as well. What are some of those forums you're talking about? Uh, htguide.com, uh, Parts Express has a really good forum. Uh, there's uh, DIYaudio.com is a really, really good one. Um, and those are, I, there's a few more too. Yes? Do you have any suggestions on resources for learning more about those books? There are some books that are slightly antiquated. Uh, so there's Speaker Building 201. Uh, which goes through a lot of this. There's the loudspeaker cookbook, which is a lot more tech heavy. Uh, there's online forums are probably going to be your best bet as far as learning those, because there's sticky topics on those forums as far as you know basic FAQs. Uh, you can also call us too. I mean, we do we talk about this stuff all day. So, yes. Do you think you guys will ever do like the sixty dollar recession buster kit again? I wish. Uh, the, yeah, so there was, for those that don't know what he's talking about, we, there was this really elaborate, uh, TV that someone was producing. I don't know the brand and it doesn't really matter because it didn't fly. And they purchased thousands of VIFA drivers to use as the components in their, uh, in the TV. So it was some huge TV. They probably caught on right as flat panels were coming out or something. And, uh, or they tried to do this right as they were doing that. So we were able to acquire all these drivers at really cheap prices and they already had the crossover and then we just made some modifications to the crossover with a few parts to make it, you know, a little higher up the hi-fi chain and uh, yeah, it was a cheap kit. I mean, yes, if that happens again, the problem is really the crossovers. We can usually find cheap surplus drivers, uh, but the crossovers, I mean, the part, the copper alone is just so expensive, so the coils, you know. Yeah. Anyone else? Yes. Maybe this is a question for your CS representative, but sure. those drivers are, are very expensive compared to a lot that you can find that are made in China. What are you paying for with that additional cost? First of all, they're actually not that expensive. Um, these particular units. I mean, the, the tweeter is a little under $50, and the mid-base is going to be, I think it's around $90. So... That's for a, for a product uh, engineered and manufactured in Norway. Uh, that's a pretty good price. To answer your question more specifically, they're higher end drivers. I mean, they have real research and development behind them. And, you know, the proof's in the pudding. I mean, they've been making drivers for years and have all the measurements to back it up, the quality control to back it up. And, uh, and yeah, I mean, I, I don't know. I can, if that answered it specifically, but they'll, they'll measure better. Consistency. Yeah, consistency. Yeah. Every driver is tested. Each individual one is tested. Each one is stored in a computer at say us. We can bring <coughs> back to the driver. Um, the tolerance levels on these drivers are much tighter than what you have on a, you know, on a on, you know, Some Chinese drivers are good, don't get me wrong, but on the ones, you know, the, the European, you know, the Scandinavians have been a the lot speaker. They have many years yeah, and it shows in, in, in what they do. So um, we just think it's a, a higher quality thing. It's European. It's not cheap in Europe. It does cost money. And uh, but if you want something that's just a little bit better, it's, 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 it's a 
consistency and reliability. I'm sorry? Consistency and reliability. Consistency, reliability, and performance. Because our, the R&D, you know, there's very little original R&D going on in China. If you get a good driver out of China, it's because some European or some American designer has designed it for them. They build it, but again, in the factories, it's all hand work. It's all done by hand, and there's a lot of turnover in the factories in China. So if, you know, we have people that have worked in our, in our factory for 40 years, you know, and we have very little turnover there. So they do this, they have years and years of experience in building these drivers. And uh, believe me, drivers are, are not things that are machine built, not these things. These are, these are hand, this is a lot of hand work involved here. So it requires real skill to do it right. And, and there's a lot of precision involved. That's pretty good. You certainly can, um, and it's advisable to do so. But in reality, the, you know, this is not taking up much volume. The port tube's not taking much volume. There's, a, there's room. We're not sending this thing to the moon. You know? So you, you don't, I mean, it's, it's a good idea to pay attention to every single little detail. But on a, something like this where we're not talking, there's really nothing taking up that much volume in there. So... Yeah, I mean, you could run the simulation on 19 liters instead of 20 or 18, but that's not really going to change the port tube more than a quarter of an inch. You know? So it doesn't really affect it that way, as much as you might think. There's a plus minus in all this stuff. Is that it? Yeah. yeah. No, um, how about the importance of the hookup wire? Because obviously, you can buy $25,000 cables that go from the amp to the speaker. How important is the wire within this? Oh, uh, it's a loaded question. Uh, so yeah, so that's probably a, a question. Yeah. I'm thinking about like maybe the gauge. Sure. Like, is it maybe better to do like a like a 12 gauge on the woofer and the 16 sure. on the tweet or something like that? Does that make more sense? A lot. I mean, a lot of this is making yourself feel good about what you're doing with the build, um, because the well, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the truth is, you could probably. <laughs> yeah. So. You want to make sure it's thick enough gauge. This in here is thir that I use for this is 13 gauge. That's overkill. I mean, we're not, the signal's traveling, what's this, two feet? I mean, it's just not, there's not going to be any resistance in that. So uh, high quality, uh, you know, oxygen-free copper, that's good enough. Of course, the sky's the limit on all this stuff. Right. Yeah. But, yeah, no, it's not monster cable. <laughs> Anyone else? Give some stuff away. All right.